Dear Lord Jesus, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable unto you. Heere, baie dankie vir die prachtige aand. Heere, as ons so kyk na die sonsondergang daar aan die achterkant, dan weet ons, Heere, jy is een machtige God. Heere, ons wil in hierdie aand net die naam kom loof en prijs en groot maak. Heere, dat ek hierby voog nie raak gesien sal word nie, maar net die glorie. Ons loof en prijs jy, dankie Jesus. Amen. Soos baie van julle weet, omtrent so 12 dag gelede het Dr. Isaac Burger vir my gebel en vir my laat weet dat hy sal nie meer kan kom na die konferentie toen hy oor dat hy hartoperatie moet, moet ondergaan. En onmiddellik waar ek gedink het, dit sal een groot teleerstelling wees en, en miskien dalk angst, was dan vrede in my hart gewees, want ja, ek het geweer die Heer het, het een ander plan. En vroeg in hierdie week, so by dinsdag vroeg, die ochend toe ek wakker word in my stilte tyd, toe wees die Heere net vir my, laat ek moet kom deel rondom paas en seens. En die rede hoe kom ek, glo die Heere dit op my hart geleed is, ek het daai pad gestap om nie een goeie verhouding met my pa te heen nie. En ek wil dit, ek wil net dadelijk sê, dat as ek dit sê, bring ek nie oneer in my pa aan nie, want enige ding kom van twee kante af, En in my geval was het ook so geweest. daar was net so baie fout aan my kant. So, as een mens daar die pad gestap het, glo ek die Heere geef jou autoriteit om te kan praat daar oor. En my gebed vanavond is rechtig dat die Heere harte van paas en seens sal sag maak. Want ek het daar pad lang gestap, voor ek tot een keer gekom het, en besef het, dit hoef nie so aan te gaan nie. So, ja, ek wil met julle gesels vanavond daar oor. Maar voor ek daarby kom, wil ek net iets aanhaal wat om Engels al so baie keer gesê het, en hy sê die volgende, One genuine miracle is more powerful than a thousand sermons. En dit is so, so waar wat hy daar gesê het, en ek wil, ek wil vanavond met julle een miracle deel, en net om te illustreer hoe groot God is. Die 19e december verlede jaar, en ek deel reeds hierdie, hierdie wonderwerk, want dit het op hierdie terrein gebeur, by die huis daarboe, waar die haka is. Op die 19e december, kom my vrou, en een van die vrouwen wat vir hy help, om die huis skoon te maak, dat gasten daar geblei, en uh, sy kom en die kom buis, en sy sien die huiskassie is dood, en sy besef, maar die gas is seker toegedraai, en sy probeer die gasborrel draai, maar sy kry hem nie gedraai nie, en toe dog sy, maar sy sal maar die pijp afdraai, en hem vervang, En toe sy die pijp afdraai, toe blaas daar een groot hoeveelheid gas uit in die vertrek. Maar sy is toe nie bekommerd nie, want daar is nie een vlam of iets nie. So die gas het blij uitblaas, terwyl sy die, die pijp wou terugdraai. En die volgende oomlik, toe slaan al die gas in die brand. En my vrou slaan in die brand. En sy het uit die kombuis uitgehaard loop en geskree, help my. En die volgende oomlik, toe toet sy op brand. Nou, daar was een paar wonderwerke, daar was die eerste wonderwerk wat gebeur het, en die, en die tweede wonderwerk wat gebeur het, is dat die gasborrel nie ontplof het nie. Ons kan het tot verdag nie eindig verklaar nie, ons weet net, dit is die Heerse genade, want as hy ontplof het, ja, was, was alles weg gewees. En so het my vrou my gebel, en ek het daar gaan haal daar so, en ons het daar hospitaal toegevat, en ons dokters hier by dorp het, het na omgesien, En so paar dagen later, toe gaan ons poort Elfre toe, want het was net voor kerst wees na ouwers toe. En uh, die wonde het al hoe erger begin lyk. En dit was aanvankelijk eerste graad wonde, maar later die dokter gesê, dit is tweede graad wonde. En die dokter wat hierdie nawek aan dienst was, dokter Leonel van poort Elfre, ons gaan toe na sy spreekkamer toe, um, laat hy vaak kan help met die verbande en die goed. En die eerste ding wat my opgeval het, toe is in hy spreekkamer instap, is sy bybel, wat oopgeleed daar langsom. En ek het onmiddellik die vrede van die Heere aangevoel. En hy het vaar gehelp in die verbande en alles weer aangesit en twee of drie dagen later het ons weer soon toegegaan en, en hy het met ons gedeel dat hierdie absolute wonderwerk is. Medies kan jy nie verklaar dat my vrou so gauw gezond geword het van die 20 of 30% brandwonde nie. En hy het net gesê, die Heere is groot en goed. En Leon het ook met ons gedeel 
dat hy het al meer mense genees in die gees in sy spreekkamer as visies, net omdat hy getrouw is en luister na die woord van die Heere. So ek bring lof van al die dokters en uh, ons maak hier die Heere sy naam groot in hierdie wonderwerk wat hy gedoen het. Die volgende deel kom ek terug na die, na die pa sien toe en dis iets wat rarig baie nabe in my hart le. Ek het nie self een sien nie, ons het vier dokters, maar ja, ek en my verhouding, my pa was nie baie goed geweest nie, soos ek vroeger gesê het. En om Engels het weer by geleentheid gesê, tell people what God did for you. Hou net aan, as jy nie weet wat om te sê nie, vertel vir mense what God did for you. En dis wat ek vanavond wil kom doen hier so, en mense kom bemoedig, en paas en seens kom bemoedig, want die Heere het het, het deurgekom vir my, en vir my pa. Ek was by een woord in aksie kampie, uh, kamp, ek het so twee of drie jaar terug uh, getuig daar oor, en ek wil net vluchtig sê vir die manne wat toen nie hier so was nie, die spreker het die aand daar vir ons verduidelik hoe werk het, as jy en jou pa nie goeie verhouding het nie. En ek was op die stadium terreen so 30 jaar oud, En vir die eerste keer verstaan ek toe wat het beteken as jy en jou pa nie een goeie verhouding het nie. God is in die boekant, jou pa is daar en jy is hier. So hierdie, slecht, hierdie verkeerde verhouding of nie goeie verhouding nie, blokkeer jou verhouding met God. En skielik gaan die liggie aan en ek besef, maar dis my probleem. My verhouding met God is nie wat het moet wees nie want hier is een blokkasie, ek en my paase verhouding is hier reg nie. Daai maandagochtend vroeg, ons is die, die woord in aksie was daarin uit nagewees, ons hy sondag terug huis toe, maandagochtend vroeg, laai ek my tweejarige dochterkie, sy is nou 18, in die bakkie en ek sê, sissie, ons gaan vir opa keier. En ons rei oor van het loof dam toe, waar my pa bly, en ek laai haar daar by die huis af, by oma, en ek sê vir pa, ons gaan rei het draai en so daar onder by die waterkant gaan stop, en uh, daar kon ek vir my pa sê, pa, ek is jammer, vir my aandeel, in hierdie slechte verhouding, en die traan het net begin vloei, en ons kom mekaar druk, en my pa het vir my jammer gesê, en ons het, ons het geëmbruis, en net daar, in die geestesrealum, verander dit als, dit was, een godelike oomlik, wat ek moes wacht tot 30 of ja, 30 jaar oud, voor ek gesnap het, maar ver, vergifnis beteken so baie, en daar kon ek en my pa sy verhouding herstel word, jare daarna, het ek weer na my pa toe gegaan, en vir hom gevra, pa, sal jy my nie sien nie, sal jy my nie sien en salf nie, ek het die olie saamgevat, en my pa kon my salf en sien, so dat ek kan sien. Dis die prinsiep van, so nou staan die borrelkie olie, daar by die voordeur in ons huis. As my vrou of my kinders uit die huis uit gaan, as hulle moet rui er ver heen, dan haal ek die olie uit, en ek salf elkeen van hulle, dat die heren moet hulle gaan op hulle pad, waar hulle ook al gaan. Maar dis die, die prinsiep, wat so ontzettend belangrijk is, laat Jy geseen kan word, so dat jy kan seen. Ek het giste marag net so, toe ek daar na die, daai area toe stap daar so, toe sien ek vier, vier manne na my toe aangestap kom. En ek moes na hulle toe stap, hulle, die gees het my net aangetrek na hulle toe. En ek wil gauw vir die vier manne vraag, hulle nie vir my sal opstaan nie. Dis een opa grootje, een opa, een pa en een seen. Wat so saam, so by mekaar, Hulle help, vir, hulle help vir die opa op, maar prijs die Heere vir opa soos oom, wat hier so is, en waar vier van hulle, daai sien is seker so 10 of 12, maar ons loof die Heere vir die familie soos julle, wat rechtig vir ons allemaal een voorbeeld is. Prijs die Heere. In 2004, met die eerste Mighty Men op Shalom, vertel om Engels die story, toe hulle die dag daar net na Marigete sessie gehad het, en dit was die haai moeilike tyd, die manne is allemaal lis verslaap, en hy weet nie eindelijk rarig wat om te sê nie, en skielik om sê die geest vir hom, hier is paas en seens hier, wat sy saak hier reg is met mekaar nie, 
Ek dink daar was omtrent so 250 manne, ek weet, Dave Turner het al 7 die mighty mens bijgewoon, en hy was die dag daar gewees, so hy bevestig wat ek sê, en om enkel sê, hier is een paar en een sien hier in hierdie gehoor, wat sy verhouding nie reg is met mekaar hier, en hy kyk rond, en hy kyk rond, maar niks gebeur hier, en die geest sê vir hom, hou net aan, en hy sê weer die selle, en toe hy die vierde keer sê, toe staan daar een paar daar, hy kant in die hoek op, en die sien staan daai kant en daai hoek op, en hulle kom voor en toe, en hulle kom druk mekaar, en begin te huil, dit was omtrent so drie hierdie marag, hy sê, negen hier daai aand, toes hulle nog nie klaar met daai sessie nie, toes hy die paas en siens wat voor en toe kom, om rechtig te kom rejoice, soos die, soos dit in Engels gesê word, en mekaar herig te, ja, om daai verhoudings te kan rechtstel, So, as ek aan hierdie pa verhouding denk, denk ek aan die historie van oom Engels, wat hy vertel het. Een ander ding wat ek graag met julle wil deel is, is oor geestelike vaderskap. Ons het so baie geestelike vaders in ons land nodig. Oom Engels is my geestelike pa en hy het 200 geestelike seens. En ja, ek het vier geestelike seens wat ek mentor en voorbid. En ek wil erg die manne bemoedig vanavond om geestelike seens uit te vertel aan te neem in aanhalingstekens en vir hulle te bid en een pad saam met hulle te stap in alle facet hulle van hulle lewe en rechtig een verskil te maak in jong mannese levens. Oom Engels praat baie van mentor the men. Hy het in die vroege jare die heren om ook gestop. Hy het op baie crusades gegaan en toe sê die heren vir hom stop eers hier, so kan sy leer hierdie goed, maar begin om jong manne te mentor, want dit is die toekomst van ons land en ons weet die jongmanne moet een pad saam in die Heere stap, so ek loof om Engels vir dit wat hy toebegin het en mag ons die legacy, mag ons dit voor en toe neem in hierdie land wat ons so lief voor is en wat Afrika vir oogend ook ervan gepraat het ons moet hier vanaf uitgaan om een verskil te maak in hierdie land van ons waar vir ons so lief is die volgende ding wat ek met julle wil deel is iets wat Kruik heel gesê het, in een boek van hom geskryf het, en as jylle vanavond baie van die goed vergeet wat ek gesê het, is hierdie, ek dink eindelijk die kruks van dit wat ek wil sê. Hy het in Engels geskryf, There is something in the inside of every boy that longs for the blessing of his father. Is dit nie so waar nie? is dit die maar wat ons allemaal wil hee nie, die blessing van ons pa af, en ons as paas kan het gee vir ons kinders, there is something on the inside of every boy that longs for the blessing of his father. En dan denk ek terug aan die gedeelte van Esau en Jacob, en ek gaan net met julle deel, in Genesis 27, toe Esau en Jacob, die verhaal ken julle goed, maar ek wil nie die eerste vier verse met julle deel, toe Isaac baie oud en al blind was, het hy sy oudste sien Esau, geroep en vir hom gesê, my sien, en Esau het geantwoord, hier is ek. Isaac het vir hom gesê, kyk, ek is al oud, en ek weet nie wanneer ek gaan sterf nie, vat nou jou skiet goed, jou peil en boog, en gaan vel toe, en skiet vir my een stikkie wild, kom maak dit dan vir my lekker gaar, soos ek daarvan hou, en bring dit vir my, dat ek het kan eet, en jou kan sien, voor ek sterf. Dit is vir my net so een wonderlijke stikkie, om te bevestig, dit wat gesê word, van een siening, van een pa, wat oor moet gaan as hy sien toe. Ek wil net vir die paas hier vanavond vraag, hoeveel keer sê jy vir jou sien, jy is goed genoeg? Want ek dink, dis eindelijk maar al wat jou siens wil hoor. Of jy nou nie sê of die of jy is paan speel, wat maak dit nou eindelijk saak op jou eind van die dag? Pa moet vir hom sê, jy, my sien, is goed genoeg. Hoeveel paas sê vir die siens, ek is trots op jou, my kind. Ek is rechtig trots op jou en ek wil paas er erg bemoedig om het meer gereel te doen. 
en dan natuurlijk die heel belangrijkste van alles is, ik is lief voor jou. Sê dit soveel is moendlik vir jou sien. Ek is lief vir jou. Daai woordkies klink so eenvoudig, maar dit maak een ongelooflike verskil in die seense lewe. En dan aan die seense kant, terug na die paas toe. Pa, dankie vir alles wat jy vir my doen. Hoeveel keer sê ons dit nie vir ons paas nie? Ek het so baie nagelaat om te sê, pa, baie dankie vir, jy, vir wat jy vir ons doen. Hierdie plaas waarop ek hier vorig het om te boer, Ek het soveel jare gevat of my pa te sê, dankie vir dit, in die dag van ons slechte verhouding nog. Maar die is daar seker vir ons so baie, dit is so groot voorrecht om hier te kan boe, op Godse grond en om hier um, sy doel te kan, kan voordoen. En sien sê vir die pa, uh, pa, jy is my jero. Dit is wat die pa wil hoor. Sien sê bykie vir julle pa, paas, uh, paas, jy is my jero. En dan natuurlijk, Die, die liefde in, papa, ek is lief vir jou, is so belangrik in enige verhouding. Die ander ding wat Kruik heel gesê is, when a father blesses his son, he empowers him to prosper. When a father blesses his son, he empowers him to prosper. Is dit nie fenomenale woord nie? En die prosper, beteken nie noodwendig financieel nie. Eindelijk beteken het heel iets anders ter. Dit beteken dat hy geseen sal wees in sy huwelik, geseen sal wees in die grootmaak van sy kinders, gezondheid, en dan ook as sy seen in die bediening wil ingaan, dat sy pa hom sal seen daarvoor. Daai wonderlijke vers, wat dus in Joosja 24 uh, vers 15 lees, Ek en my huis, ons sal die Heere dien. Mag dit rechtig waar wees, van elkeen van julle vanavond hier so. En dan wil ek afsluit met die gedeelte, wat Austin Sarsen gesê het, en ek denk dit, dit som het eindelijk op, en uh, ja, ek gaan het lees, en, en dan wil ek rechtig vraag, voor ek het lees, wil ek vraag, laat die paas en die seens wat by mekaar sit, wil julle nie opstaan, En as daar dinge is wat nie reg is nie, dit beleid die oor mekaar, en die eenvoudige ding doen en sê, ek is jammer nie. En as daar paas en seens, soos noem Engels, een geval, wat uit mekaar uit sit, en die Heere druk het op jou hart, wil jy nie voor en toekom, pa en seen, en het hier voor allemaal kom doen, om, as een bewys van, jy is rarig, dis wat jy wil doen, en dis jy hart begeert nie. So, Ek wil net die gedeelte vir julle lees en dan nooi ek julle uit. Maar ek wil graag vir julle bid. Die paas en seens wat sommer nie daar kan staan waar julle by mekaar is, is dreig. En die paas en seens wat uit mekaar uit is, wil julle nie voor en toekom dat ek vir julle gebed kan doen nie. Die laaste gedeelte wat ek met julle wil deel, sê, een kind sal eers werkelijk een vader in God sien, as hy iets van God in sy eie paas sien. Is dit, die, is dit die waarna ons allemaal smag nie? Kinders wil vir God raak sien, maar voor dit, moet hy eers vir God en sy eie pa sien. Goed manne, ek, ek nooi julle rechtig uit, daar waar die paas en seens by mekaar is, wil julle nie opstaan, dat ek vir julle gebed kan doen nie. En die paas en seens wat uit mekaar uitstaan, wil julle nie voor en toekom, dat ek saam met julle kan bid nie, asjeblief. Dankie Jesus, dankie Heere vir die manne wat voor en toekom, dankie vir die manne wat opstaan. As nog geleentheid is daar manne is wat, wat wil voor en toekom, wat ook nie by jou pa sit nie, wil jy nie voor en toekom nie, ek wil net so een oomlik kans hier, voor ek begin bid. Goed manne, kom sluit die oor dan, dan bid ek. Heere, baie dankie dat ek vanavond vir paas en seens kan bid. Heere, ek bid dat jy sal vergewe wat gebeur het in die verlede en een nieuwe skoon blaai sal omblaai vir paas en seens in hierdie gehoor vanavond. Heere, kom maak jy niet, heeltemal totaal niet, Heere. 
dit wat ik kan getuigen wat in mijn leven gebeurt, het, Heere, glo ek is moendlik vir elke een hier so vanavond. Heere, ek wil ook om bid vir, vir seens wie sy paas nie meer daar is nie. Heere, wat ook hard seer is vanavond, ek wil rechtig vir hulle voor u bring. Heere, wees u hulle pa, soos Retief hulle net nou gesing het. Be there, Father, waar hulle nie meer een pa het nie. Heere, maar ek dink, dis ook een wekroep vir elkeen van ons. Moe nie uitstel, om recht te maak nie, want jy weet nie, hoe lang jou pa nog gespaar gaan bly nie, maak dadelijk recht, jyre, ek loof jy al reeds, vir elke verhouding wat herstel het, ek weet die engel in die hemel juig, in jybel, jyre, van een paas en een seense verhouding, is so kritisch belangrijk, dat ons weet jyre, jy juig oor elke jyvelik, ach, pa verhouding wat, wat herstel word in die aand, Dankie Jesus, ons wil net die naam loof en prijs. Amen. Jylle kom ons sê, dankie. Ek gaan nou oorhandig na Louis Els. Hy gaan die tweede gedeelte van vanavondse verrichtinge doen. Louis, baie dankie. Wow, what a beautiful day and a beautiful time that we've had so far. Die Heer is goed vir ons, hy is genadig en levens is verander. Ons is dankbaar. Ek dink, ek kan die patroon sien. I can see, I think I can see what God's doing is. We had wonderful worship before the throne of God. We saw men came out. The Lazaruses that came out. And I believe that as we go to roll away that stone and deal with the stuff, as Africa shared this morning on so many things, but ended off by saying, we need to live a spirit-filled life. Um, tonight, I want to talk to you about the importance of spiritual sight. The importance of spiritual sight. Won't you just say this with me for a moment? Won't you ask the man next to you, what do you see? Nee, so bietje harder is dit. Wat sien jy? What do you see? I want to talk to you tonight about spiritual sight. I really believe that South Africa is positioned for choice. In the day and the time that we live in, we are positioned for choice. It takes me back to the time when Jesus was standing before Pontius Pilate and a nation was positioned for choice. At that moment in time, there was a man called Jesus Christ and a rebellious zealot, a murderer, a rebellious man called Barabbas. And Pontius Pilate brought out Jesus and Barabbas and challenged a nation to choose. To choose either a love revolution or a violent or a violence revolution. And I believe South Africa is positioned again to choose to choose a love revolution or a violence revolution. And I believe that everything has got to do with what we see. There is a phenomenal battle on for both your and my ears and eyes. Because I believe what you hear is what you see, is what you do. When we lose the ability to see, see properly, we lose the ability to dream. And when you lose the ability to dream, you mess up your todays. And when you see only today, 
and you only see what is physically around you, it affects the way that you plan your tomorrows. And if the things that you see around you are only violence, mismanagement, xenophobia, and all kinds of other things we've heard today, it robs you of your faith and leaves you hopeless. That's why it's so important for us to see correctly. When we see God's tomorrows for our lives, it changes the way we respond today. In December last year, we had a situation in our hometown in Jeffreys Bay. Some of you might have experienced that. Where we lost power for three days. In the middle of high season. You can imagine it. It was chaos. People got so fed up with it as raw sewage spilled onto parking lots. That they packed their bags and went home. Pledging to never come back to Jeffreys Bay. The frustration, the irritation was high. At that time, apart from having holiday, I was also beginning to prepare for the new year. Every year as we come into the new year, I trust God for a word, a word of encouragement, not just a nice sermon, not, not just something nice to preach, but a word that I could stand up on the stage and speak with conviction and with excitement and minister the word of God so that there will be hope and courage and faith in the hearts of the people. I had to be honest. I said, God, you know, I have to admit that some of these things are getting to me. I, I believe and I'm excited and I'm, and I'm positive about some things, but I just, I just wanted to say to you to honor so that you can touch my heart. As I sat there, God began to speak to me. He began to speak to me a word that, that he gave to me and to us for as a, as a community for the year. And he said to me, I want you to move to a higher vantage point, son. I want you to get to a place in your life where you are not looking for, from things at the, at the bottom up, but where you look at, from things at the, from the top down. It, it reminded me of a friend of mine that once said to me, he went to visit two of his Christian friends. And as he walked into the one's office, it's, there was a sign above the, bo above the door that said, keep on looking up. And he said to his friend as he walked in, that's a nice sign you've got there. He says, yes, I, I, want to, I want to remind people and myself that I need to always trust God and keep on looking up. A few days later, he went to visit another friend and there was a sign above his door that says, keep on looking down. He walked into his friend, he says, it's quite a strange sign you've got here. Because I went to our buddy and he once said, keep on looking up. And he said, yes, it depends on where you're seated. And the word of God tells you and me that we are seated with Christ in heavenly places. And God began to speak to me and said to me, it is time for you and for specifically Christians to begin to function from a higher vantage point. I don't want you to work to truth. I want you to work from truth, son. And the word of God says that you are in me. And when you are in me, your state of being is looking down. At, and when you stand up on that hill, whether it's at the cross or any hill, your perspective, your outlook on life is greater. And the higher you go, the further you can see. And the higher you go, the wider you can see. And God says, as long as you are running around in the woods, you'll be in the woods. And as long as you are between a rock and a hard place, all you'll see is the rock and the hard place. And I want you to know that I have got a plan for you and I've got a plan for the church and I've got a plan for the community and I've got a plan for the city and I've got a plan for South Africa, but you will never know it until you get to a higher vantage point. Hallelujah. 
I realized that God was calling me not to climb a mountain, not to strive for something. I believe He's calling us as men. Even as He has called us out from our graves, even as He's calling us forth to be men, to deal with the sickness and the condition so that we are not just saved but whole. Not just saved and whole, but that we are spirit-filled. He's also calling us and say, I'm calling you forth men to live from a higher vantage point. You're going to have to live from a higher vantage and see what I see for your life. You're going to have to see what I see for your marriage. You're going to have to see what I see for your family, for your business, for your friendship, for your partnership, and for South Africa. Because you see, at the end of the day, what you see is what you hear, and what you hear is what you do. Because we don't just hear in words, we hear in pictures. And there's a contention, there is a, there is a, a fight for our sight. And every day news and, te- and television and newspapers and social media is, is bombarding our minds with images, with visuals, with things that affects the way we speak and the way we act. And there is a physical, but there's a spiritual realm. And many times our spiritual realm is affected by other spirits that affect our physical realm. And I want to say to you tonight that God wants us to have spiritual insight. By the time that we leave here tomorrow, after Uncle Angus, when Angus have spoken to us, and I know like somebody said this afternoon, Pastor Andre Raybert said, you know, when Angus is here, I'm sure he's going to hit it out of the park. And we're excited, but by the time he walks up here tomorrow morning, I trust God that he will sense, as God would see, the shift that have taken place in this place this weekend. And we want to leave here tonight with a spiritual insight and a revelation of how we will live our lives in the days to come. As I stood there, challenged to the core of my being, That I can't live life in the woods. Oh, I need to come down. I need to come down from from that higher vantage point to live life. But the difference is, instead of living in the woods, living in my circumstances, being affected and touched by what is happening around me and then crying out to God for help, I'm in that place with God and see what He sees and hear what He says and then go and apply that. There's a difference. There's a difference from living from the bottom up than living from the top down. Not with an arrogance, not with a superiority, but from a place of being seated with Christ. Africa said it this morning, a place where we can see what God sees, hear what God wants, is is speaking, and from that place live it out. It was at that time that God took me to the book of Jeremiah. What an amazing portion of scripture. I want to read a few verses to you tonight and trust that God will speak to you and encourage you. You see, the word of God tells me, guys, that this thing called sight is the issue of darkness and light. There's a scripture in Luke, chapter 11, verse 34. It says, For the lamp of the body is the eye. And when the eye is full of light, the whole body is full of light. But when the eye is full of darkness, the whole body is full of darkness. All he's saying is this. Hey, when you see bad things, everything about you acts bad. When you see something from a negative perspective, with a judgmental attitude, full of doubt and skepticism. It's not just your eye that see it. Your mouth speaks it and your body acts according to it. When the eye is dark, the whole body is dark. When the eye is light, the whole body is light. I begin to read. I read this wonderful chapter out of chapter 1 in Jeremiah. It says, the words of Jeremiah, the son of Hilkiah, of the priests who were in Anoth, in the land of Benjamin. Verse 2 and 3 are interesting verses. They said, To whom the word of the Lord came in the days of Josiah, 
the son of Ammon, the king of Judah, in the thirteenth year of his reign. And it came also in the days of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, until the end of the eleventh year. And, and so it carries on. And I read the scripture, and I felt the Holy Spirit said to me, I want you to read it again and again. I did. I didn't get anything out of it. Carried on reading, it says, Then the word of the Lord came to me again, saying, Before I formed you in your mother's womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. I ordained you a prophet to the nations. And then I said, O oh Lord God, behold, I cannot speak. I'm a youth. But the Lord said to me, Do not say I'm a youth, for you shall not go. You shall go to all of them who I send you, and whatever I command you to speak, that's what you'll speak. Do not be afraid of their faces. For I am with you to deliver you, says the Lord. And then the Lord put forth his hand and he touched my mouth. And the Lord said to me, Behold, I have put my words in your mouth. See, I have this day set you over the nations and over the kingdoms to root out, to pull down, to destroy, and to throw down, to build and to plant. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, Jeremiah, and said to me, Jeremiah, what do you see? And I said, I see a branch of an almond tree. And then the Lord said to me, you have seen well. For I am ready to perform my word. I said, Lord, what do you want to say to me? The Lord said to me, I want you to read it again. I'm, I'm inviting you to a higher vantage point. I want you to understand that you are not going to go through the next season based on what you can physically see, on your physical ability. You, you, you need to see something else, son. And I read it again. I, he said to me, read it again. He says, I want you to make it personal. And I read it. And I begin to see God begin to open my eyes. And the word of the Lord came in the days of Josiah. And I realized all of a sudden, there is a word that God wants to bring to you and me. The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. Isn't that exciting? I want to tell you today, you and I need a word from God. You need a personal word from God. God is a speaking God. God is a personal God. God is a God that wants to be involved in every facet, every dimension of your life because He loves you and He's interested in you. God wants to speak to you. And I realized the word of the Lord came and I realized how important it was because I started reading scriptures like Romans 10, 17 that says, so then faith cometh by hearing and hearing the word of God. I realized that when you hear the word of God, I'm not just talking about casually reading the word of God, but when you hear the word of God, it produces faith. When you hear the word of God, brother, when you hear the word of God, it does something to you. It shifts something. It gives you a boldness and a confidence and a security that you didn't have be, until you've heard that. It causes you to do things, to submit, to give up, to give in, to step out. And I realized the word of God came to Jeremiah and it produced faith. I, I read it again. I realized the word of the Lord came in, in the days of Josiah. I said, well, I don't know who Josiah is. God said, just made it personal. And I re started rereading. I said, and the word of the Lord came to Louis else in the days of load shedding. I, oh, okay, okay, I need that. And the word of the Lord came to Louis in the days of mismanagement and chaos and other challenges. That, and I begin to put them in there. And I said, yes, God, I need a word from the Lord in this day of load shedding, of xenophobia, in the days where, where things are not in order. I need a word. I realized that when I read verse 3, it says it came in the days of Joachim, the son of Josiah, until the 11th year, I realized the word of the Lord doesn't just want to come once. God wants to keep on sending words and it will carry on until we have completed and finished what we should. Can I get a big amen? Yeah. There is a word for you, sir. There is a word for you, mighty man. There is a word for you, dad. There is a word for you, husband. There is a word for you, businessman. There is a word for you, son of God, so that you can make a difference. There is a word in the days of load shedding. There is a word for you in the days of xenophobia. There is a word for you. doesn't matter what situation you're in. There's a word. I thought that's exciting. I begin to realize that Jeremiah was assigned as a young man to his kingdom assignment. Israel was in a mess. They were in bondage. 
they were rebelling against God. They were doing their own thing. To be honest, if you read the book of Jeremiah, things didn't go too well for Israel, but God was going to raise up a young man to speak to a nation on his behalf. He wanted to tell them how much he loved them. He wanted to tell them that he's married to the backslider. He wanted to tell them that there's hope in their future. To be honest, one of the most beautiful scriptures in Jeremiah is Jeremiah 30 verse 17, where God says to Israel, there's hope in your future, Israel. May I dare to say to you, there's hope in your future, South Africa. God speaks to him. God's going to give him an assignment. And God is getting this young man ready for his kingdom assignment. But before he gives him his assignment, he's going to have to deal with a few things. He's going to say to him, I want to tell you a few things, Jeremiah, that you have to get this in line because this assignment has got, is a bit bigger than you. And God begins to speak things. The word of the Lord is going to come to Jeremiah, but then it says some strange things. I read some things. It says the word of the Lord came to him again. And the next verse I read, it says, I knew you before you were formed in your mother's womb. And I realized that God said, Jeremiah, I want you to know that before I give you assignment, sir, mighty man, dad, businessman, father, before we send you out here today or tonight or tomorrow, we want you to know before you were formed in your mother's womb, God knew you. God was saying to Jeremiah, before I'm going to assign you to this kingdom's assignment, I want you to make sure of your identity. Retief spoke it tonight. Several people spoke it tonight. I want you to know, sir, it is time that you establish your identity in God. Paul says it in Acts. He says, in you, God, I live and move and have my being. I am who I am because of you, not because of what I do. I said it to the young people when I ministered to them. I said, I want you to understand something. The quicker you find your identity in God, the better. Because if you don't find your identity in God, you'll pay a lot of money for an image. You'll wear gold chains, low profile tires, grow chest hair, shave them, pluck them. You'll do funny things. People do funny things for an image if they have not established their identity in God. You need, to be, you need to know that, that you were fearfully and wonderfully made. God didn't make a mistake when he made you. He didn't do it over a weekend. He didn't do it on a Friday before Chila time. He did it fearfully and wonderfully and carefully. And when God put you together with your father and mother before your mommy and daddy planned you, he planned you. Long before they thought they're going to go away on a long weekend, God was already made up his mind who you're going to be, what you will look at, how much hair, how little hair, how wide, whatever. He designed you. He designed you with a purpose. He made you good at some things and not so good at other things so that you're not the full answer. But your identity is not in what you do. It's who you are. And it's who you are. And he said, Jeremiah, when I'm going to send you out to do this thing, my boy, I want you to know who you are in God. Because this thing is greater than you. This thing is not about making you famous. This thing is about making God famous. And he says, I want you to know, Jeremiah, that I designed you, I shaped you, I formed you, and I got you ready for this thing. And I want you to make sure that you look up to me. And when you look up, don't look around, because if you look around, you go around, Jeremiah. Look up and fix your eyes on me. I thought, that's good, God. Help me to do that. And then he says in Jeremiah 6, uh, verse one, verse, chapter 1, verse 6, Jeremiah responds to God. He doesn't say, Lord, I'm excited about that. He doesn't say, God, I'm so glad that you've made me and formed me. I'm so excited that you're calling me. The first thing that he says, he listens to what he says, Lord, behold, God, I cannot speak. I thought, God, what, what, what are you saying to me? And God says, you know, when I give you an assignment, normally when God gives anybody an assignment, the first thing they do after the assignment is make excuses. And God says, I just needed to put that in so that when other mighty men read it one day, that I want to say, make as many excuses as you want and then get over it. Can I get a better amen than that? God says, I made you. He says to Moses, Moses says, God, I'm, I stutter. God says, I made your mouth, Moses. 
God says, I made you. It's not how great you are, not how equipped you are, how able you are, it's how available you are. This thing you're not going to be able to do because you've got a degree or because you've got long pockets or because you know somebody that knew somebody that knows somebody that really, but rarely um gert ken nie. This is this has got nothing to do with connections. This has got to do with nations, with the kingdom of God. This is bigger than you and me. And God says, so, so you don't have to worry. You don't have to worry about the lack of money. You don't have to worry about the lack of education. And you don't have to worry that you can't speak the language. You don't have to worry about anything. You just need to make, know that when I call you, I will empower you, Jeremiah. And I believe that God wants to say to us after we come out of the cave, after we deal with our stuff, we get empowered with God, that He says, I'm getting you ready. And before you leave this weekend, I want you to put every conceivable excuse that you can ever make down at the altar this weekend. And then the Lord said to me, and I want you to know, do not say, I'm a youth, for you shall go out to whom I send you, and whatever I command you shall speak. God's beginning to get him ready. He's beginning to say, listen, I'm not looking for your opinion. I'm not looking for your religious angle on things. I don't want you to preach at people, condemn people, judge people. I don't want you to give your angle on the whole deal. I want when I send you out, when I sent you back to your wife, when I sent you back to your children, when I sent you back to your business partner, when I sent you back into your neighborhood, when I sent you back into South Africa, when I sent you back and you touch with other uh, cultures and other nations, then I want you not to give your opinion. I want you to speak what I tell you to speak. For the authority and the clarity and the liberty lies within the word of God. <laughs> And as I keep on reading this portion of scripture, I read the most ridiculous verse. How many of you know that sometimes God put things in the Bible that I don't know why he put it there. He, he, he puts a thing in here that says, and do not be afraid of their faces. And then I realized, I realized I've been in conversations with other men and with other people. And long before they've answered you on what you've said, they've answered you with their face. We, we do that with one another. A guy tells you a story and then you love that one eye, bro. And then you say, There's something about a face that affects the way we behave. There's a way that you look at your son. There's a way that you look at your laborer. There's a way that you look at your boss that tells a story long before they open their mouth. And God says, Jeremiah, I'm going to assign you to something when you go back to your family, when you go back to your neighborhood, when you go back into your nation and you begin to speak what I speak, they're going to lift their eyebrows, Jeremiah. And I don't want you to be moved by their faces. I've been married 31 years, 30 years now to a cute blondie. We've got four children. They're all out of the house now. And there's an amazing thing about her. You know, when I preach at different places, it's not just when I preach, but when we move around, she's got there. But I know, if you know what I'm talking about, I will greatly value if one or two men can just wave at me when I say what, I just gonna, what I'm going to say now. When I sometimes preach and she sits in the front and then she moves that one eyebrow, that means it's now time to close. If there's anybody that can identify, well, just, just some brave men, please identify. Thank you, gentlemen. I honor you tonight. That, that, that she could just move. She can stand on this side of a room and I on that side. And when I get that eye, it moves me. There, there's something about a face. And I said to her, you know, sweetheart, this thing that you use your eye. I don't like the way you use your eye. And then she says to me, what eye? I said, that eye. You know which eye I'm talking about. 
And I said to you, you know what's the amazing thing about that eye of yours is, is that, that I don't want you to use the eye, is that you use the eye and it affects, and that after 31 years, I still allow it to affect me. <laughs> Listen, men, I want to tell you something tonight, that there's an assignment for you. And you're going to bump into some faces long before anybody has said any. Oh, you've been there. That mighty man thing. Oh, you're also one of them now. Mm -hmm. they, they're going to pull a face and God says, and listen, this assignment, this kingdom assignment that God is getting ready for you. I don't know what, where and how, but listen very clearly. It is there and it's going to be clear when you open your ears and your eyes. When you move to your vantage point, your life is changing this weekend. You can never go back the same. You are not going to go back just being born again. You're going back whole, delivered, empowered with a higher vantage point. You are not looking from the bottom up. You're looking from the top down. And you might not see it clearly, but God's going to open it up to you because this nation needs men that see things from God's perspective. I say, God, help me not to be moved by my woman's eyes and also not by those around me. And he said to him, Jeremiah, I want you to know that I'm sending you forth in my name. This is not a good project. This is not a new idea. This is not going through your connections. I'm sending you. And until God sent you, you don't do anything. You make sure that you wait until you hear. You make sure that when you go, you'll be able to stand in front of whoever you go to, to say, I don't come to you with sticks and stones. I don't come to you in my own power and my own ability. I don't come because I've got an opinion. I also don't come because I'm going to be moved by your face. But I do come in the name of God. I come in the name of Jesus. And then the Lord put forth his hand and touched the mouth of Jeremiah. He said to him, Jeremiah, I want you to know this is a kingdom thing that I want you to do. Behold, I want to put my word in your mouth. And see, I have this day set over you nation said you over nations and over kingdoms to root out, to pull down, to destroy and to throw down, and to build and to plant. This is not about throwing people over. It's not about overthrowing people or throwing people over. Or th it's about kingdoms. The Bible says we do not fight ag against flesh and blood. We fight against principalities and powers, forces and high places. We are posed. We are positioned for choice, men. That we're either going to hear and see the Jesus and his love revolution. Or whether we're going to see Barabbas and shout, let him go and crucify Christ. God says, I want you to know when I put my word in you, this thing is going to change nations and kingdoms. It's going to change nations and kingdoms when you do what I tell you to do. God's telling to Jeremiah, he says, Jeremiah, I want you to know the thoughts that I think. I want to say that to you before I close tonight. In Jeremiah 29, 11, God speaks and he says to his nation, he says, I want you to know the thoughts that I think towards you, says God, not to do you harm and destroy you, but to give you hope in the future. Can you hear that tonight? Can you know that God says, he says I want you to know the thoughts that I think towards you. And, and, and he could have stopped there. But before he stopped, before you and I could say anything, God says this. He says, before you tell me what I think, let me tell you what I think. Before you tell me what I think, let me tell you what I think. For I know the thoughts that I have towards you. I know that circumstances around you in the physical. I know that there are things around you in what you hear that doesn't sound so great. But let me tell you what I'm thinking, says God. Of course, I know that you are sitting in groups and discuss the opinions of other people and what the newspaper says and what the television says and what the economist says. You are thinking all kinds. And I know, I know what, you, what they are saying, but let me tell you what I'm thinking for you. In Isaiah, he says this, he says, arise, shine, for your light has come. 
And then he says this, and he says, darkness will cover the earth and gross darkness the people. God is saying, listen, just by the way, if you think I'm not realistic and I don't know what's happening on the earth, let me tell you that darkness will cover the earth and gross darkness the people. And yet you need to arise for your light shall come. In this place of darkness, God wants it to shine. He says, I want to send you forth to overthrow kingdoms because we can change a nation one man at a time. And then he asked him this. The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah and he said to him, so Jeremiah, tell me, what do you see, my boy? What do you see? And I want you to know something tonight that when God asked Jeremiah, what do you see? He didn't ask him what was wrong. That's a no-brainer. That's a no-brainer. God didn't ask him, Can you see what's wrong, Jeremiah? So that Jeremiah could say to God, let me tell you a few things that I think you didn't see. He he wasn't asking Jeremiah, what do you think is wrong? Can can you see what's wrong? Can can I tell you a few other? That's what he was trying to do. He said to him, Jeremiah, I know that there's a whole lot of stuff happening on this earth. And I know there's a whole lot of stuff happening with Israel and and they're going in a direction. But I want you to come up here to me, Jeremiah, so that I can show you what I'm seeing concerning this backsliding nation. For there's hope in their future, Jeremiah. And I'm thinking good thoughts about them. And there will come a day, Jeremiah, that I will pour out my spirit upon them and soften their hearts. And I will not have to preach the the word of God to them anymore. Because the word of God will be written on the tablets of their heart. and They will follow me willingly. But I see a future for them. What do you see, Jeremiah? I hear Christians talk about South Africa and they talk about a little bit of hope and we should have faith and we need to trust God until something happens. And I see on Facebook and I see on social media and I see everywhere that the the Christians are more negative than half the world. And then I realize they try to be positive and they try to have a little bit of faith and they try to kind of sometimes approach the thing from another side, but they never get to a place where they see what God sees. And I realized that this world and this nation needs men that will see. Not ignore, but see what God sees. And I want to tell you, brother, I want to tell you, sir, I don't know about you, but if I can't see what God sees, I see a lot of junk that I don't want to see. And if that's all my eye behold, then my body and my mouth will act according to that. And I know there's a higher place. I know there's a vantage point. And there are men sitting here tonight that haven't just got a natural eye. They have got a spiritual eye. And there is a contending for your spiritual eye. That's why the devil constantly throw physical bad things in your face. So that you will not have a moment to see what God wants you to see. When Africa, Mishlope, stands up here and he paints you a different picture, I'm sure some of you saw something different this morning. Now you can say a better amen than that. And I want to say to you tonight, sir, when the word of God says, with God nothing is impossible, he means that. I also know that it's not me that's going to do it, it's not you. And that's why God is calling forth Jeremiah's tonight. He's saying, I'm going to give you an assignment. I've got a word coming to you for your wife. And I've got a word coming to you for your children. I've got a word coming to you for your family and for your business and for your friendships and your connections. And I've got a word coming to you for your neighborhood. I've got a word coming to you for South Africa. Will you come closer so that I can give you your word? In this time, in this time of Josiah, in your time, whatever time, whatever season it is that you're going through. And then God says, and listen, by the way, this thing that I'm going to give you to do is bigger than you. So I want you to establish your identity in me so firm and strong so that you will not be moved by people's opinions because we are not here to look for and try and win a popularity contest. We are here to shift something for the kingdom. And when you establish your identity, there are a few things that will challenge you and get rid of your excuses know that I am able to anoint you 
I'm able to empower you and I'm going to put my word in your mouth. And when I put my word in your mouth, it will be the same word that shaped and formed the universe. And when you speak my word, just as my word came out of my mouth and spoke the earth into existence, it will speak things into your family, into your children. But you better make sure that you really see it, Jeremiah, because if it's just a glimpse or an opinion or just kind of an image that you get, circumstance will change it for you. So Jeremiah, what do you see? Jeremiah said, God, I see an almond tree. He says, you've seen well, Jeremiah. He says, I'm going to now put my word in your mouth. And you are going to go out and we're going to be a prophetic statement to this nation. Oh, all you wonderful, beautiful men of God. God is looking at you tonight and, say, and saying to you, I've got a word for you. And then he says this in verse 12. He says, you have seen well, Jeremiah, for I watch over my word to perform it. Listen to what God's saying. He says, Jeremiah, you can't claim left, right, and center and think I'm just going to perform for you. What you're going to have to do is find out what I'm thinking, what I'm seeing, and what I want to do with you, with your family, with your business, with your neighborhood, and with your nation. And when you find out what I see and what I think and what I say, even if it's uh, exactly the opposite of what you see, what you think, and what you've experienced, if you can see that and you begin to proclaim it and declare it, then Jeremiah, I will perform my word. Let me tell you something tonight, brother. That's a hard thing. That's a hard thing because I'm a natural man. And I felt God said to me, you make a choice, son. You make a choice. This now, I didn't ask you whether it's going to be easy. I want you to make the right choice, not the easy choice. But there is a spiritual man in you with a spiritual eye in Corinthians, Paul writes about it. He says, for spiritual things are not discerned by the natural man, for the natural man can't see them. But the spiritual man can. And when you are born again of the Spirit, I wish I could preach on it tonight. I can't. Time is running out. But I know the Word of God says, unless you're born again, you will not see the kingdom of God. I know that there's another scripture in Corinthians that says this, for in Christ the veil is taken away. I know in Matthew, he says, for the pure in heart will see me. I know that he says in Revelations 3.18 that he says, for if you can't see, ask me and I'll give you eyes self so that you may see. But there's a cry. I say, God, I'm seeing too many things that is affecting my mouth. It's affecting my actions and my attitude. And I need to see God. And this is the time that we need to see. So that we can allow our mouths and say what God says. So that God can do what God says he will do. No, no, tonight is that night. Tonight, God's going to take veils off. Tonight, I need men to stand with me and scream out and call out to God. I've asked these wonderful men to lead us in worship. I'm not going to lay hands. We're not going to call people out. We're going to just stand as a group of men and say, God, I'm no longer a slave of fear. I'm yours. Fear will not manipulate me, will not intimidate me. They are gonna, if you want to come out, you can by say, Lord, I need to see, open the eyes of my heart, God, because there are too many other things that I see that affects the way I speak and affect the way I behave. God, help me to see my wife in the right light so that I can speak to her the way I should speak to her. Let me see my sons and my daughters so I can speak to her the way you want me to speak. God, let me see other cultures and other nations the way you want me to see it because I'm seeing things now that affects my speech, my attitude, and my behavior. And so South Africa needs to see God. And I don't know about you, but I'm desperate. And so I'm going to ask this man, I'm going to pray a prayer. And I'm going to ask this man to lead us. And I don't know when we're going to stop. I'm going to hand it to them. I'm going to hand it back to, the, to Yanni. But we're going to worship him tonight. And I'm going to say, Father, will you remove the veil from my eyes, Father? I'm seeing things that I don't like. 
I see things just sometimes in the natural and I know there's a spiritual man that you want me to see from a spiritual point of view, the way you look at things so that something can shift in my heart so that my mouth can align and I won't give my opinion and I won't just share casually, but I will speak as the Lord commands and I will speak as the Lord touches me and that I will uproot and overthrow and pluck out and establish new things because God is able to do the impossible so that God can come to you and say, hey, you, Jerome, hey, Gert, Koos, John, Peter, Anton, Andries, I'm watching over my word in your life to perform it, son. I'm on your case. I'm, I'm for you, not against you. I know the thoughts I'm thinking. So won't you lift your hands with me tonight, men, if you want to. Father, how I ask you tonight to remove veils. Forgive us for the time that we just look at everything physically. That we approach everything just from a natural point of view. But God, we pray tonight that you'll take all these wonderful men to a higher vantage point. There's a vantage point for South Africa. There's a vantage point for South Africa. There's a vantage point for South Africa to look at it from a higher place in and through God. And we will begin to declare it with one, one voice. And we'll prophetically declare what God says He can and will do. And if He could, He can turn it. He's turned it many times in the history of mankind. He'll turn it again. And so tonight we pray, open our eyes that we may see. May see ourselves. May see our family. May see our children. May see our marriages. That we may see our neighbors and our neighborhood. That we may see our cities. That we may see what you see, God. And Father, even if it's exactly opposite of what we think and feel, open our eyes and give us the grace, the power and the anointing to speak accurately and declare so that you may perform your word and everybody shout it, amen.